Hello, and welcome to the story of Rhode Island, the podcast that tells you the story of Rhode Island's fascinating history. In last week's episode, we watched Rhode Island help lead their fellow colonists into a series of protests to protect the right of political representation. As time passed, those protests grew even more violent until a war finally broke out between the Americans and their mother country. As we jump into episode four, we take a look at a group of 1,500 Rhode Island soldiers who have chosen to risk their lives so that they can regain their sacred rights as Englishmen. While observing them at their camp located just outside the city of Boston, it's hard to miss their stark contrast to the British soldiers they'll eventually be fighting. Unlike the British military that's filled with career soldiers in well-polished uniforms, the American rank and file is made up of farmers, artisans, and tradesmen wearing an array of mixed and match attire. Standing alongside the Rhode Island soldiers is Brigadier General Nathaniel Green. Green has been chosen to lead these men into battle due to his relentless devotion to the Patriots' cause and with some convenient help from his well-connected family. Similar to the soldiers in his regiment, Green is also an unlikely warrior himself. In fact, there's nothing about Green that would make one think that he's ready for the role that he's just been given. Not only does he have no military experience whatsoever, but he grew up in a Quaker household that taught him to despise the evils of war. To make it worse, he doesn't even fit the image of an 18th century soldier. The limp he's had since he was a young boy made even his own neighbors in the Kentish Guards reluctant to march with them. But nonetheless, this limping Quaker from Coventry has managed to overcome the odds and become the youngest general in the colony's newly created Continental Army. And now, he and this ragtag group of Rhode Islanders have decided to team up with their equally unassuming American colonists and go to war with the British Empire. For the time being, most of the colonists see this war as a necessary evil to regain the rights as Englishmen, eventually allowing them to return to the fold as subjects of the British Empire. But as I'm sure you already know, that's not what's going to happen. Instead, the Americans will discover that the only way their inalienable rights will remain intact is if they create their own independent nation. And some of the first colonists to advocate for such an extreme outcome are the same rowdy group of Americans who we watched ignite some of the revolution's earliest protests. As the troubles of war continue to plague the towns around Narragansett Bay and British ships bring their economy to a standstill, the Rhode Islanders will find themselves craving independence more and more every single day. Eventually, they will grow impatient with the more moderate colonies that are hesitant to agree to such a drastic act, driving the leaders of Rhode Island to lead by example by becoming the first colony to publicly turn their back on their king. Such an action not only further weakens their already loosening ties with their mother country, but once again puts them at the vanguard of the American Revolution. The story of how the people living around Narragansett Bay helped drive their fellow colonists towards declaring independence is what we'll cover in this week's episode of the Story of Rhode Island podcast. Surrounding the city of Boston on a July day in 1775, are soldiers in America's Continental Army. And while their various different uniforms and social norms illustrate how the colonists are still in the process of forming a joint American identity, there is one thing that pretty much all of them have in common, a lack of discipline. As we observe the colony's regiments, we see filthy camps in complete disarray, men constantly leaving their posts before being relieved of duty, and in the distance, we hear the sound of long-range shots being fired at British officers that stand no chance of hitting their target. However, amongst this sea of disorderly regiments is one that stands out from the rest, the Rhode Island Company. For the past month, their Brigadier General, Nathaniel Green, has turned his group of dysfunctional soldiers into the most disciplined and orderly of them all. He frequently inspects their uniforms to ensure they are clean, forces anyone physically unfit for duty to attend an extra hour of daily exercise, and spends a countless number of hours putting his troops through a series of drills. To ensure he leads by example himself, Green rises early every morning while also working late into the night, showing his men just the type of commitment that they'll need to even have a chance of winning this war. Because while the American soldiers are just beginning to learn about the necessary training and discipline that is needed for battle, sitting inside of Boston are thousands of well-trained British soldiers led by three of Britain's top generals, Henry Clinton 
William Howe, and Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne. These are the men Green thinks about as he meticulously studies his troops parading on the grass in front of him. But those thoughts quickly disappear when he realizes that walking towards him is the tall man from Virginia who's just been named the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. Green quickly adjusts his posture and puts on an even more determined face than what he had on before. Then, as the commander approaches him, he greets him by saying, General Washington, good day, sir. Washington, with his always stoic personality, responds warmly by saying, Good day, General Green. I must say, I once again find myself impressed by the discipline and organization I see in your men. While attempting to hide his excitement from Washington's approving words, Green thanks the commander-in-chief, but explains how they still have a long way to go. Attempting to act as if his knowledge of war expands beyond what he's read in books, Green states how at some point the excitement from the early days of war will wear off, and all these men will have to rely on is their discipline and training. Knowing that the sentiment shared by the general from Rhode Island is all too true, Washington nods his head in agreement and once again observes the soldiers drilling in front of him. As they watch, Green asks his commander when he thinks they'll get their chance at the British. Washington replies that he's not exactly sure, but hopes it'll be soon. Both Green and Washington missed the Battle of Bunker Hill that took place back in June, and each of them are anxious to get their chance at the enemy waiting for them in Boston. Then, Washington goes on to tell Green that he's sorry to hear about the difficulties his people have been dealing with now that the British Navy patrols Narragansett Bay. He wishes that they had the resources to do something to help, but it's simply not an option at the moment. Green thanks the commander for his sympathies, but tells him how his people are able to hold their own. He reminds Washington that his fellow Rhode Island colonists have been wreaking havoc on British ships long before this conflict even turned into a war. Washington smiles in agreement and jokes about how the British Navy in Narragansett Bay might just be in more trouble than the British troops in Boston. Green laughs at the commander's joke and appreciates what it says about his fellow colonists. But at the same time, he also knows that in reality, things are looking quite bleak for his fellow colonists. As he thinks deeply about his wife and the many others back home who now must face the devastating effects of war, he becomes saddened by their hardships. And as he continues to think about the people living around Narragansett Bay, we too visit the area that's on his mind. As we do, we see just how much life has changed in Rhode Island now that the Revolutionary War is underway. If an artist were to have a bird's eye view of Narragansett Bay in the summer of 1775, they'd have no trouble painting a picture of a colony at war. Towards the bottom center of their painting, just above its lower frame, would be numerous British patrol ships sitting at the mouth of Narragansett Bay. Their large white sails and red flags create a commanding appearance, while also acting as a constant source of anxiety for the local citizens. Not only have these ships put a hold on all trade in and out of Narragansett Bay, but their large cannons leave the colonists wondering when their towns will come under attack. If you were to shift your sight to the bottom right-hand corner of that painting, you'd see thousands of people fleeing Aquidneck Island, hoping to escape the British ships threatening their towns. While following these displaced men and women north through Bristol and eventually into Providence, you'd come across two armed naval vessels named Providence and Washington sitting in the city's marina. These two ships make up the first navy to have ever been created by one of the colonies. Leading this small armada is Commodore Abraham Whipple, the same man who helped lead the raid on the Gatsby back in 1772. If you then continue to follow some of the displaced Rhode Islanders past Providence and back south toward South County, we'd see some of the first war forts created by the local militia units. On the western shores of the Providence River is the Sassafras Hill Fort, while further south on the shores of the Greenwich Cove stands Fort Daniel. If you were to then zoom back out and continue to observe the bay for the rest of the summer of 1775, you'd end up seeing much of the same picture. British ships patrolling the waters, people moving out of Aquidneck Island, and additional forts being built along the shores of Narragansett Bay. On the other hand, what you wouldn't be able to see are the effects that these actions are having on the mindset of the local citizens. As their colony continues to deal with the challenges of war day in and day out, fewer and fewer people have any desire to repair their relationship with their mother country. And before long, most begin advocating for independence. But such an idea is by no means new to the colonists living around Narragansett Bay, as one of the colony's leading newspapers, the Mercury, has been telling its readers since 1774 how the only path to freedom is to have Congress, quote, complete the system for the American independent commonwealth, unquote. 
And while such a thought was too radical for most to publicly agree with back then, a majority of citizens end up in favor of such an outcome as events continue to escalate towards the end of 1775. It starts when British ships shell the town of Bristol in October, and then continues into December when British troops raid Connecticut Island. Then, in January of 1776, even more people are persuaded towards the American colonies declaring independence when a man by the name of Thomas Paine publishes a pamphlet called Common Sense. Paine explains how the American colonies must devote themselves to freeing their colonies from the evil monarchy abroad by creating their own nation of free individuals. These words resonate deeply with the Rhode Islanders, and as their commitment to independence becomes even more intense, so does their willingness to retaliate against the enemy. Shortly after the release of Payne's pamphlet, Captain William Barton and his Rhode Island militia unit attacks a British foraging party on Prudence Island, killing two while wounding another. By the time spring arrives, it seems to be a foregone conclusion to many Rhode Island patriots that their revolution is heading towards the founding of a new nation. Then, in April of 1776, the pride in their glorious cause is heightened when they watch the leaders of their Continental Army parade through Providence, putting them face to face with the men who will lead them to freedom. Lined up along North Main Street in Providence is a gathering of colonists filled with excitement. One of these individuals is a young man in his 20s named Theodore Foster. As Foster attempts to push his way towards the front of the crowd, he keeps his eyes set on the street in front of him, ensuring he doesn't miss the arrival of Rhode Island's guest of honor. With the British having evacuated Boston a couple of months earlier, and the war's fighting now shifting to New York, the Continental Army is on the move. And news has arrived that some of their generals will be passing through Providence while on their way to New York. And rumor has it that General George Washington will be one of them. The young man hopes that he's able to catch a glimpse of the general who's been tasked with leading the Continental Army to victory. Foster is not only an ardent supporter of the Patriots' cause, but is also a recent graduate of the College of Rhode Island. Although initially founded in Warren back in 1764, the College of Rhode Island has since been relocated to Providence, and at the start of the century, will become known as Brown University. Eventually, after a few aggressive maneuvers, Foster finds himself standing directly in front of the street that Washington will be walking down, and takes a minute to gaze back at the sea of onlookers. Women stand there in their finest attire, while children sit on the shoulders of their fathers who have brought them to this historic event. Then, the man they've all been waiting for finally enters the city. As General Washington marches south down North Main Street, Rhode Island's governor, Samuel Cook, walks proudly by his side. Governor Cook himself is a wonderful example of what the Rhode Islanders are willing to do to ensure their colony is fully devoted to the Patriot cause. Initially, Cook was only elected to be the deputy governor of their colony, but when the people decided that the man they originally elected to lead them Joseph Wanton, wasn't fully devoted to the revolution, they had Wanton removed from power and replaced with Cook. When Foster sees their governor and General Washington pass him, the young man cheers loudly while admiring the commander's noble appearance. The calm yet assertive demeanor Washington has as he rides on his horse creates a sight that leaves the people in awe. Following shortly behind him are two continental regiments led by Nathaniel Green. Knowing just how important public perception will be to winning this war, Green has instructed his troops to wear their finest uniforms, have their rifles cleaned, and their faces neatly shaved, creating the illusion that this group of farmers and artisans have been transformed into a well-trained army. Shortly after the regiments pass Foster as well, General Washington is seen making his way towards the house of Stephen Hopkins, the former Rhode Island governor and a man who is currently out of town attending the Continental Congress. Hopkins House will act as Washington's headquarters for the next couple of days, and is yet another building of historical importance that still stands in Rhode Island today. Before entering the house, Washington turns towards his fellow Americans, removes the tricorn hat from his head, and waves to the crowd. Foster and the others in the crowd, energized by a feeling of pride for the Patriots' cause, erupt in a roaring applause. They firmly believe that the man on that doorstep and the soldiers around him will lead them to independence. However, while the people in the crowd hope for such an outcome, the Americans from some of the more moderate colonies are not so sure they're ready to part ways with Great Britain. And although these colonists are quickly becoming the minority, the people of Rhode Island are not too keen on waiting much longer for everyone to get on board. 
to make it crystal clear to all exactly what they're aiming to achieve. The leaders of their colony decide it's time to make a daring statement that will hopefully inspire the other colonies to help bring the revolution to its inevitable outcome. They do so by making a statement directly to the king himself, letting him know that they've had enough of his tyrannical ways. Their daring declaration comes only about a month after Washington leaves Providence, and it once again puts the Rhode Islanders at the forefront of the American Revolution. Perched up alongside College Hill, with its back up against Benefit Street, is the Providence Colony House. The importance of the building is illustrated by its Georgian-style architecture and Flemish bond brick walls. Located only about a tenth of a mile west of the Colony House is the Mishasic River, the same river that Roger Williams traveled up when he founded the town of Providence back in 1636. And although the town has changed quite a bit since its founding, one thing has remained constant. The town's thirst for freedom. But instead of religious freedom, the people of Providence are now hoping to be freed from the tyrannical ways of King George III. After being at war with the British Empire for a year now, the people of Rhode Island are more than ready for independence. It's due to these sentiments why we see the members of the Rhode Island General Assembly making their way towards the Providence Colony House. It's the afternoon of May 4, 1776, and a nervous yet determined look can be seen on the delegates' faces as they enter the building. While filing into their seats, little is said amongst the men as their minds are far too focused on the act of defiance they're about to commit. When all the delegates make it into the building, and with the assembly ready to begin, a man by the name of Jonathan Arnold makes his way to the center of the room. Along with being a member of the colony's government, Arnold is also a surgeon in the Continental Army and the head of the military hospital in Providence. Needless to say, he's a devoted member of the Patriots' cause. In fact, he's so devoted to their movement that he authored the radical act that he now holds up in front of him. As he begins reading its words to the members of the assembly, his voice trembles, partially due to nerves, but even more so because of the excitement flowing through his body. Arnold reminds the crowd how King George has sent, quote, fleets and armies to America to confiscate our property and spread fire, sword, and desolation throughout our country in order to compel us to submit to the most debasing and detestable tyranny, unquote. Then, he continues to explain how because of these horrific acts, it's no longer reasonable for their people to remain loyal to such a tyrant, and that it's time for the colony of Rhode Island to renounce its allegiance to King George III. After finishing his statement, Arnold takes a minute to observe the reaction of his fellow statesmen. On their faces is a stern and contemplative look. As the seconds pass, a tension-filled silence continues to fill the walls of the colony house as the members consider the magnitude of the words that have just been read to them. If the act were to be approved, then the Rhode Islanders would no longer be loyal subjects to their king. And although technically they wouldn't be declaring independence, a fact that is often misrepresented today by a holiday known as the Rhode Island Independence Day, it is without a doubt a bold and incredibly defiant move. It would mean that Rhode Island would officially be breaking ties with their king and making their only remaining link with the British Empire their loyalty to Parliament, bringing them closer than any other colony to eradicating their connection with their mother country entirely. It is not only a powerful statement, but one that also comes with dire consequences if this war does not end up going their way. Because of this, it's easy to understand why the men in the room are hesitant to vocalize their support at first. Sensing their hesitation, Arnold decides that they might need some more time to process what's just been proposed, so he begins making his way back to his chair. But just before he leaves the front of the room, he hears a man pounding the bottom of his cane on the colony's wooden floor, letting Arnold know that he supports the bold declaration. By the time Arnold turns towards the man making the noise, the pounding of another cane is heard as well. As each second passes, more and more of the men join in, and eventually, the once silent room is consumed by the sound of collective defiance. The men are telling their fellow colonists that the time for reconciliation is over, and it's now time to begin the process of creating a new nation, one that prioritizes liberty over the unjust will of a select few. Shortly after the act is passed, word makes its way to the members of the Continental Congress meeting in Philadelphia, and the men representing Rhode Island are proud to know that their little colony is continuing to drive this revolution forward. And so, with a little nudge from the people living around Narragansett Bay, the representatives in Congress continue pushing the rebellion towards its inevitable conclusion. 
As the weeks pass, the voices of the more moderate members of Congress continue to dwindle until they become almost unnoticeable. Then, in July of 1776, the members of Congress officially sign the Declaration of Independence, turning the colonists' fight to regain their rights as Englishmen into a war for independence. When one of the Rhode Island delegates, Stephen Hopkins, goes to sign the document, the other delegates around him notice that his hand is shaking. Realizing that everyone thinks his hand is shaking due to nerves and not because of the Parkinson's that's begun to plague his body, Hopkins reminds everyone that although, quote, my hand trembles, my heart does not, unquote. But nobody would have blamed Hopkins if fear would have been the reason for his trembling hand, because at that moment, Hopkins, along with his fellow Rhode Island delegate, William Ellery, are two of the 56 members of Congress who have officially committed treason, a crime that's punishable by death. But even with such severe consequences at stake, the bold action taken by these men goes on to obtain the support from their colony's government just a couple of weeks later. On July 19th, the Rhode Island General Assembly ratifies the Declaration of Independence, officially revoking their status as a colony of the British Empire and transforming their society into the state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations. Having just been freed from the British Empire, the people of Rhode Island decide that it's time to celebrate. And on the afternoon of June 20th, 1776, that's exactly what they do. And although they don't know it yet, their celebration in Newport will be one of the last free acts that they're able to commit on the island of Aquidneck for the next three years. It was almost a century ago when the people of Rhode Island celebrated the end of the Dominion of New England and the reinstatement of their beloved democratic institutions. But never in their wildest dreams did those people ever imagine celebrating those same rights while also being part of a nation outside of the British Empire. But as we take a look at Newport on this warm day in July of 1776, we see the people of Rhode Island doing just that. With a large crowd gathered around the Newport Colony House, the people wait for the Declaration of Independence to be read to them. Before long, John Handy, an officer in the Richmond Militia, steps out in front of his fellow Americans and begins to read the document out loud. As his voice travels into the ears of each and every person in front of him, Handy feels his heart begin to pound from a feeling of elation coursing through his veins. The members of the militia in the audience listen closely, knowing that the words in this document details a list of rights that they might end up sacrificing their life for. As Handy makes his way to the second paragraph, he tells the crowd about these rights. He states how, quote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, unquote. Such sacred words touch the heart and minds of every single man and woman in the crowd, while leaving those of color left to wonder when they'll be included in that statement as well. While such a dichotomy of liberties is left unaddressed for the time being, it's one that future generations will have to resolve with bloodshed and war. For the next few minutes, Handy continues to share the document's words to the crowd while they listen along in awe. Then, he comes to the final sentence and states how he and his fellow colonists, quote, mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, unquote. When Handy is done reading, 13 shots are fired by the local militia, followed by a series of three cheers from the civilians. And although the bodies are injected with a feeling of pride for their glorious cause, an underlying sense of anxiety exists amongst the group as well. The people of Rhode Island know that declaring independence is one thing, but defending it will be a far more difficult task. As they have already experienced over the past year, the British Empire has no plans of just allowing their highly profitable American colonies to slip from their hands without a fight. King George has every intention of showing the colonists just how easily their plans of creating an independent nation will crumble at the hands of the British military. To ensure this happens, 24,000 British soldiers and 8,000 hired Hessian troops are on their way to the American colonies to squash the rebellion. Their arrival will not only give Nathaniel Green his first taste of battle, but show him that he still has a lot to learn. After suffering the biggest loss of his entire career, Green and Washington will find themselves on the run, while General Henry Clinton and his joint British and German forces make their way to Rhode Island. Before long, Aquinnick Island will be handed over to the British enemy, and nearby towns will be destroyed by invading troops, teaching these highly defined Americans just how much it'll cost them to protect their independence. 
But that's a story for next time on next week's episode of the Story of Rhode Island podcast. Thank you for listening to the Story of Rhode Island. If you are enjoying the podcast, please be sure to leave a review and to follow the podcast as well. If you'd like to learn more about today's episode and others as well, you can visit storyofrhodeisland.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at Story of Rhode Island or on Facebook at the Story of Rhode Island Podcast. Thank you again and see you next time.